the Evolution Security Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Evolution Security Podcast. This is Aaron Davis and Eric Davis, the official Tactical Twins. And um, we are here going to do a fun, special episode that is going to be the gear and mindset bonus episode. And, you know, this is something that we love to do. We're kind of going to go back to some basics of what we used to do on some of our earlier shows and and um, cover a lot of topics that are important to us, some current topics and and some fun gear that we get a lot of good use out of and just have a fun time chatting, Eric. What do you think? Yeah, yeah you know, gear that supports our path, you know. And, and again, we we like to use this type of bonus show to go over books, go over, you know, defensive use stories, you know, just things that, that are important to us that we believe that our audience will benefit from. We, we just kind of got into a, a realm where we've had such awesome guests and we always will have awesome guests. It just, it's, it's amazing to me, Aaron, you, we sit here and think about it. It's like, we never thought that we would have the ease of just rolling through uh, guests and the top industry guests so easily. We, we've always got people lined up. Yeah. So we just want to make sure that we're staying, staying to our roots as well and uh, covering stuff we think that, that our audience can benefit from, not just guests. Yeah, and... That's my thought. And, and you know, this is, this is fun for us to, to get here and chat. And, you know, we can offer our thoughts that... Um, that we often may not have the time to do on other shows. And, you know, we, and, you know, I want to make clear, we, we don't deem ourselves as intellectuals and, and major experts on all these things, but we've been learning a lot from a lot of amazing instructors. And, and there's just some things that don't get covered enough or, you know, just, it's nice to, just sit back and chat in a laid back manner too, you know? Well, Aaron, you know, the other thing is, is that we are political beings, you know, mm -hmm. um, you and I and, and Brian and, and all of us in this community, we, we've elected not to be very political, not because we're afraid to be political, but we felt that in many cases that just adds a little noise to, to the discussions but, you know, there's times we are in a time where I think we might get a little bit more political, not not with hyperbole. That's not necessary. But just in some cases, we, we want to make sure that 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 we're being advocates for the Second Amendment and that we're we're definitely going to mention a little more politics. And, and you know, th those of us that believe in 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 freedom. You know, we, we kind of got to talk about things like that sometimes, too. So this bonus, this bonus type of show that we're going to try to have maybe once a month, um, we're going to include some stuff like that. And I'm sure their audience members are going to be fine with that. And some of them will probably welcome it. Well, there's there's no denying that that there is. Is constant attacks on on freedom right now, and and that I know that can sound a little bit trite, but man, I, I just don't know what else to say. It, it's just every day you look at what's going on, and you know this the new governor of um, New York just standing there saying, "Now we would like for people not to lose their jobs, but." I have this executive power and we're going to force all medical workers to get vaccinated. You know, that's, that's pretty terrible. We're, we're not, I'm not going to debate whether someone should get vaccinated or not here either. It's, it's the simple fact that 
when has anything like that been? Especially, I know it has, I don't know of any time where where government leaders have have tried to pull that kind of power, you know? Not at the federal level, especially. Um, you know, you can point back to polio. You know, th- there's the argument that, oh, we require it in schools. Well, that's been at the state level is what I've been tracking. Well, and it's been, it's, they're vaccinations that have been used for decades. Precisely, and, and that that is the point. And that's my problem with forcing people to get a vaccination that's in I heard a doctor say this and and you know there's many sources we didn't even plan on talking about this but (laughs) and we'll jump in our in in our awesome store we got lined up but you know we're in phase three of vaccination um uh, vaccine excuse me let me say this correctly we have vaccinations people are get, getting them but yet we are actually still in phase three of trials is what i've heard a couple of doctors say that's my problem with making it mandatory mandatory is that we don't know what the long-term side effects could be there may not be i, I welcome people to to make that choice for themselves and i'm not gonna talk about what my current condition is yeah you know that's that's a that's a medical decision for everybody, and that's private. What I will say is, based on the CDC numbers themselves, this virus it is ab- it absolutely is a deadly virus. We've had we've had hundreds of thousands of people pass in the United States. Unfortunately, the majority of them had uh, previous. Uh, immune deficiencies and or conditions prior to the fact. But bottom line, the CDC numbers show that I think if you're above or below 65, you essentially have a 99.9% chance, I believe is what the CDC is currently saying. Exactly. And so why would there be a full-on one-size-fits-all here? Everyone needs to get vaccinated. Yeah, we're we're going off. <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> yeah. not against vaccinations. I'm just not um, at all. Not at all. And I've gotten many vaccinations. Yeah, and, over and the years. that's another thing. <laughs> Let's say that too. You get labeled if you question these things anti-vax. No, not anti-vax. I like you said. I've had all kinds of vaccinations, but it's just in this case, um, many people like me look at the risk for this virus against myself you're a healthy younger individual versus a um a a vaccine that is is possible that we just don't know enough about that's it it's that simple so to me it's it's i'll take my risk with with a virus that apparently um i'm pretty safe against with my um being in the health that I am so and Aaron you're you're probably taking precautions right you're probably washing your hands at at, er, at every opportunity you're probably you know I'll be honest with you um <laughs> I don't like touching doorknobs that often anymore. oh dude I I, ba- <laughs> I basically just do everything I do when I know the flu is going around yep the same exactly. thing you know um yep but that's enough about that buddy it just we didn't expect to talk about that, but again, we're just having some fun chatting here, and some of these things are going to come out. So, I think we have a um, we're going to go back to our roots and and read some news stories here, or a story. Yeah, Aaron, I've got a excellent piece um, that originally was posted to the mm-hmm. RealClearInvestigations dot com website. On uh, September 22nd, 2021, and it was from, what piqued my interest is I saw that it was from John Lott Jr., and for our audience members out there, maybe you've read More Guns, Less Crime. I, I read that many years ago, probably over, over 20 years ago. I read No, not probably. I definitely read it over 20 years ago, and John Lott is a... Uh, is a phenomenal researcher and statistician. And so 
he usually brings some very, very empirically based, not he always brings empirically based information. So the title of this piece is There Are Far More Defensive Gun Uses Than Murders. Here's Why You Rarely Hear Them. In full disclosure, I'll stop there a second. I'm not going to read every single um, every single sentence out of this piece because it's quite a longer article for what we're trying to accomplish here. So I'm going to hit on the highlights. We'll point that out and, and we'll banter on it a little bit. I think that there's some things in here that you and I can kind of highlight and talk about. So going to the piece. While Americans know that guns take many innocent lives every year, many do not know that firearms also save them. On May 15th, an attacker at a department complex in Fort Smith, Arkansas, fatally shot a woman and then fired 93 rounds at other people before a man killed him with a bolt-action rifle. Police said he likely saved a number of lives in the process. On June 30th, a 12-year-old Louisiana boy used a hunting rifle to stop an armed burglar who was threatening his mother excuse me, threatening his mother's life during a home invasion. On July 4th, a Chicago gunman shot into a crowd of people, killing one and wounding two others before a concealed handgun permit holder shot and wounded the attacker. Police praised him for, his, for stepping in. You know, Aaron, I'll, I'll back up for a second. How awesome that 12-year-old boy probably had been taught by his parents gun safety and and knew how to use that. You know, in some cases we don't hear about young, younger people using firearms, and we know some of those on the left don't don't like to hear about guns in the hands of, of children. But you know, we we want to keep them locked up for sure. But in these cases, it 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 certainly helped. These are a few of nearly 1,000 instances reported by the media so far this year in which gun owners have stopped mass shootings and other murderous acts, saving countless lives. And crime experts say such high-profile cases represented only a small fraction of the instances in which guns are used defensively. But the data are unclear for a number of reasons and this has pol- excuse me this has political ramifications because it seems to undercut this is crucial the claims of gun rights advocates that that they need firearms for personal protection an issue now but bet- before the C- supreme court which that's going to be big this next year by the way so i'd like to hit on that you know Aaron, it is interesting how little you hear about defensive use stories. And there's some numbers that we're going to talk about here in a second. One, some, some numbers we've been exposed to before, but some quite astonishing new numbers, in my opinion. But not having those stories in the public's eye, you know, average citizens, it does seem like guns are so dangerous and mm-hmm. that they're that you know, everybody's getting shot and killed in the streets and, you know, all the hyperbole out there. Um, But again, the the premise of this article is it doesn't make the news. It's it's not popular. Then um, hold that thought because I just want to say this, this is, there's connections to what we're talking about right now to what I want to talk about here in a little bit. Awesome. You're, you're, you're speaking of, you know, the omission of these stories, which actually shapes someone's perceived reality by not being exposed to positive events with firearms. And that it's on purpose, of course. So, yeah, absolutely. Back to the article Americans who look Only at the daily headlines would be surprised to learn that according to academic estimates, defensive gun uses, including instances when guns are simply shown to deter a crime, are four to five times more common than gun crimes and are far more frequent than the roughly 20,000 murders or fewer each year. I'll just make a point there. Um, this year's numbers just came out from the FBI, and and 
were up 30%, like the biggest increase in murders in uh, since the 60s, I believe it is. I'm Just sure uh, the tor- turmoil of the last year, um, I'm sure it, and defund police and all the riots and the emboldenment of, of people's... Bellus release of uh, criminals, violent criminals. You know, when there's no... When there's no consequence for committing a violent crime, you know, it's uh, bound to um, give them incentive to, to do it again. So back to the article here. So roughly of the 20,000 murders fewer each year with or without a gun, but even when they prevent mass public shootings, defensive uses rarely get national news coverage. Those living in major news markets such as New York City, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles are likely to hear, likely not to hear such stories, which you know in those, those, those three stated cities, those are rabid anti-Second Amendment, so not, not surprising. As of August 10th, America's five largest newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and the Wall Street Journal have published a combined total of 10 news stories this year reporting a civilian using a gun to successfully stop crime. Now, man, that is asinine. 10. 10 10 total stories out of those major newspapers. Again, that, that certainly shows an agenda. By contrast, those same newspapers had a total of 1,743 news stories containing the keywords murder or murdered or murders, gunfire, shot or shots, including articles with such words wounded. The total rises to 2,764. Man, that's quite a contrast, isn't it, man? Yes. So now we get to some of the cool news. And and we'll and I'll hit on a few more highlights, but this is the most important part of this article, in my opinion, for for folks to understand. And we'll have this article posted in our uh, show notes, so folks can c- go and read the whole article, and better yet, have it as an a- as ammunition um, for providing to people that that don't understand or or actually are vehemently against defensive use. So we want folks to have that. So, and let me make this point real quick. I'll quick. I'll digress. the The biggest problem, Aaron, with with uh, defensive use is it's hard. It's hard to measure because of some of the points I'll make here in a second. You essentially have to use surveys mm-hmm. of people that have been in defensive use. So the numbers end up um, spanning a very wide margin. Well, because because. A self-defense event with a firearm that is not used is actually, there's an event there, but there's the absence of use of the firearm, right? Or the, or the absence of an injury. So almost there's not an incident. Absolutely. To- and, uh, and Aaron, a lot, of, a lot of law enforcement departments don't record such incidents, incidences um, to record. So that's part of the problem as well. So here's some interesting data, Aaron. The U.S. Department of Justice National Crime Victimization Survey indicates that around 100,000 defensive gun uses occur each year. An estimate that, though it seems like a lot, is actually much lower than 17 other surveys. They find that 760,000 defensive handgun uses and and 3.6 million defenses uses of any type of gun per per year with an average of about 2 million. So, again, the point behind that is is really ranging from 760,000 to upwards of 3.6 million defensive uses with an average, so we can just start throwing that out there when people want to talk about it. There's an average of 2 million defensive gun uses a year. And here's the awesome part of this. 
96%, according to this article and according to these surveys, the trigger doesn't even have to be pulled. 90, I said 96, pardon me, 95% of the time, individuals don't even have to pull the trigger. Now, how amazing is that? That, that you know, defensive use doesn't even, doesn't even necessarily have to include the gun being used. No violent action. So you, this is what I think about this. The wonderful part about that is the person doesn't have to go through the legal battle. Yeah. But they certainly defended their defended their lives or their family members or loved ones. So, man, and, that's a pretty, pretty astonishing number. What do you think about that, Aaron? Well, and what I find funny sometimes is that people that are anti second amendment freedom and frankly anti self defense right of any kind they'll say well he used violence to end the situation there's no violence no, th- literally the the presence of a object that the criminal or, or the attacker did not want any part of decided to do something else, walk down the street, and that literally ended all violence. There was no violence whatsoever because of that object. Absolutely. So, and, but then they'll, they'll twist their logic to say, no, it's with the weapon, it's violence. It, well, it, the well, Aaron, absence, I'll just the, add it. the absence of action, you can, the absence of action with a tool you can call violence that, that that that's that's another point that goes into what I'm going to talk about in a little bit just complete framing of reality that is not reality well and Aaron you know I will add to this and 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 this is obviously in our community is is probably fairly well fairly well agreed upon and that there is actually righteous violence Oh yeah. Um, war defending our nation is righteous violence. And I will definitely add to it that defending one's life or one one's loved one's lives is definitely righteous violence. And you know, it's just when, it, when another individual or individuals made action, they started the action that made you have to do that. There's you Absolutely. did not you did not invite them to take that action. They initiated that action. And 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 like we always talk about, the the best the best way to win the fight is not to be in it at all. Mm-hmm. You know, and and we in our community and what we espouse is we espouse methods that avoid the fight altogether. Oh yeah. You know, with lifestyle changes verbalization, de-escalation skills, all of that. So we want peace, you know. Yeah. We absolutely want peace. So going back to the article, Aaron, um, in March, a man police described as armed and dangerous attempted to rob a home in Smith County, Texas. The homeowner pulled a gun and the intruder fled away on foot. The criminal had shot a woman the night before and had previously had outstanding warrants for aggravated assault. And I want to bring out a point here. Aggravated assault, a lot of folks may not know this, and, and if they're tracking the way that, that crime is, um, is tracked, aggravated assault used to be called attempted murder. So now if you see numbers out there of aggravated assault, to quote Tom Givens, it's just a murder that didn't work, you know, and that's that's crucial. Yeah, because um, part of the reason why some murder rates have went down is because we have such awesome medical medical attention, medical facilities. T Triple C, the the advancements in dealing with gunshot wounds has made exponential. Uh, progress over the last 20 years i would i would add that's partly or in big part because of of the of what we've learned overseas in military action 
So I wanted to really point that out. Aggravated assault, if folks out there see just murder numbers, but they don't include aggravated assault in their analysis, um, you're, you're kind of losing sight of the fact that aggravated assault is just a murder that didn't work. So I wanted to point that out. So, Aaron, I kind of want to skip over some of this because we start we start getting a little bit long-winded and there's several things we want to talk about. So um, I just wanted to point out a few of the, of the reasons that you, you just don't hear this or hear these stories, I should say. So let me, let me go back to this portion here. Defensive gun uses don't loom large as a public concern, not only because they tend not to feature dead bodies or blood, they are also underplayed because of distorted feedback loop involving news organizations. Many leading outfits use data from the gun violence archive to track firearms use. The GVA, however, relies primarily on news reports. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Creating a literally creating literally an unvirtuous circle. This media coverage focuses on the most extreme cases, which academic research suggests is actually a minority of gun uses. Quote, media stories cannot be trusted to accurately reflect the numbers, number of type of gun defense uses that actually occur, Professor Gary Mauser of Canada's Simon Fraser University told RCI. Mauser has conducted national surveys on defensive gun use National surveys find that firearms are rarely fired when used to stop violent attack, he said. Such cases are unlikely to be reported to police and even less likely to be found in media stories. Relying upon media stories would greatly undermine, underestimate, that is, the true number of defensive gun uses. So here's another gentleman that this kind of, this guy kind of made me laugh a little bit. He seems to have a little disdain for news stories. Mark Bryant, executive director of the Gun Violence Archive, defends a reliance on media accounts and discounts the argument that media dispro disproportionately cover the most violent cases. Quote, I do not think it is a newsworthy issue. Too many media really like to f the feel-good stories of homeowners standing up to home, home invaders. Brian wrote to RCI, even better, if it was a granny doing it, they don't just go off with that if it bleeds its newsworthiness, which to me, it kind of sounds like that guy's a little bit irritated with gun defense stories, maybe. Sure sounds maybe like I'm it. reading. So other experts disagree. Real Clear Investigations examined gun violence archive data for January 1st to August 10th of this year and found 774 defensive gun uses, fully 85% involving people shot, 43% resulting in death, and 42% in wounding. Less than 4% of cases involved no shot fi shots fired, essentially supporting what we're talking about. You know, the majority of defensive use stories do not get reported. So experts interviewed by RCI said this coverage makes defensive gun uses appear as if they end in fatalities or woundings at a much higher rate than they actually do. In addition, many major outlets focus on instances where defensive gun uses go wrong which may discourage people from defending themselves. So Aaron, you know, I think we've pretty much made the point of what this article is trying to, to get out, but there's one, one other section in here that I kind of want to hit on. This is another problem with news outlets is that they also typically get the story wrong and they also try to manipulate it to where it sounds like a crime. Here, here's a few examples of, of the headlines. A man upset because of a medical condition walked into a Westlaco 
Texas Walmart last fall with an AK-47 bent on shooting people. A legal gun owner intervened, and according to the TV station, his actions led to the man putting down the gun. As the, quote, hero recounted, he was totally surprised, got him to put down the AK-47. He was very upset because I destroyed his plans. That's a little bit innocuous. In Brownsburg, Indiana, in July 2020, a man opened fire at at workers at a cemetery and continued to attack on a nearby street. A concealed carry permit holder finally shot the attacker. This tragic event could have been much more disastrous. You know, so again, they don't emphasize the the real defensive use in in most cases. And here's another factor, and we'll kind of close this out. In extreme rare instances, when national news media do cover illegal gun carriers, <coughs> excuse me, prevention of a massacre, they can have a hard time getting the story straight. Taking the fatal shooting of two at the West Freeway Church in Christ near Fort Worth, Texas in December 2019, for example, the media covered this attack but repeatedly described the parishioners who stopped further bloodshed as security guards. You may recall that, right? These were not security professionals, just members of the church designated as security personnel as a kind of honorary title. Jack Wilson, the church member credited with stopping the attack, told RCI, which I'll just add, that dude was a stud. He, he, I, I can't remember the distance of that shot, but it was, it was a good 15, 20 yards, something like that. I, I, I may have that wrong. And, and it was a, 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 quote, hostage shot, wasn't it, basically? Yep. It was a straight yeah, head shot. It was a head shot, yeah. Wilson said that 19 to 20 members of the congregation were armed, but that neither he nor the church monitored who was carrying. Boy, that's a free church, isn't it? Yeah. They, they, they support the Second Amendment. But the bottom line is, is that, the media tries to downplay the citizens using the firearm. I remember picking that apart and going, man, they, this guy wasn't a security guard. They keep saying he's a security guard. He was a civilian. So, and, and he was well-trained. He trained all the time, mm-hmm. so he was prepared. So, Anyway, man, that's pretty, pretty interesting information. What do you think, Aaron? Well, I did want to add this real quick, that another study came out, and I'm, I'm not going to delve into the study, but... I do just want to mention this because it's another study that bolsters what John Lott has reported for many, many years. You know, let's just say it. Sometimes you say John Lott's name and whoever hears it's going to just ad hominem, just completely dismiss it because they've had other people with poor logic try and refute refute him, etc., but but here's another story again that bolsters John Lott's findings and in, in, in general, basically the same results. So this survey called the 2021 National Firearms Survey by Professor William English, PhD at Georgetown University. As far as I know, I, I don't see it in this this particular article, but I believe they they surveyed around 15,000 people. I mean, a huge survey. You know, out most most studies are, you know, let's just say roughly um, 1,500 people. That, that's a common sample size. But the key aspect that I wanted to point to that they found was that the majority, 75% of defensive gun uses take place out of the home. And many, 51%, involve more than one assailant. So yep. I, w- I would say that's a pretty good reason to squelch these may issue states that make you have to prove that you may need um, a firearm for self defense, a concealed weapons permit, when, you know, the proof that you need it may happen tomorrow and it's too late, you know, so. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that just a basic, a basic statistic that I love that, that Tom Givens uses on a frequent basis is that you don't have a, a 
one in a million chance of being in a violent encounter. Actually, over your lifetime, you have a one in four chance. That's right. Of being in a violent encounter, and you have a it, you have a thirty percent chance of having a second violent encounter. Yep. Over your lifetime. Yep. It, people think of it as in terms of today. Today, the odds are really low, right? I, I doubt very seriously I'm going to have to use my firearm tonight. But over the rest of my lifetime, that that, that um, probability goes up. So, Which is why we stay armed, not just with weapons like firearms, knives, pepper spray, what have you, but also armed physically with with a, a decent amount of physical fitness and, and combatives capabilities mm-hmm. too. So just to point that out there too. Yeah. Well, Eric, I think we can segue into what I wanted to talk about because, you know, your, your, your study that you, or your article that you were reading about was of course attempting to demonstrate the false reality, right. That is presented over and over and over again, it, it talk about the word systemic. There, there are systemic outlets that create the reality that we actually most people perceive. And I, what I'm, what I'm pointing to, man, I, I, I was listening to Ben Shapiro the other day, and and I'll be frank, you know, you got to give these caveats. I, I don't. I don't totally agree with Ben Shapiro on everything he says, but he's a pretty sharp guy. And I commend him for this interview. It was an interview with um, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hain. They are two professors formerly of Evergreen State College in Washington. And they are um, solidly on the left politically. But... I'll tell you, this was one of the most fascinating um, interviews I've heard in a long time. This husband and wife are brilliant, and they really put forth a very um, removed, unbiased um, way of presenting what they're speaking of. And, And again, it's just, I'm fascinated by when you hear someone so brilliant and how well they can articulate things that... You know, you're just sitting there laying back going, man, I wish I could articulate what they're saying. What they're saying is in my head, but I can't articulate it like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, me too. Man. But, you know, if if you're like me and like we've talked about, when you're overwhelmed right now with the bombardment of false info and, and really a prescribed reality that we're up against, this is not conspiracy theory, okay? That pejorative that anyone gets labeled with that actually just reasonably questions the state of affairs that are presented to us, you, these, these individuals, again, on the left, they give really good reasons, and, and they, let me put it this way, so they, they basically just articulate several main concepts they explain how reality is completely falsified by um by prevailing sources and and the approved experts and it's demonstrable false and it's demonstrable that it's a concerted effort by millions of people doing it they lay that out and all of a sudden you don't feel like you might be a, con- a conspiracy theorist by listening to these individuals they, of course, explain the radical reaction that um, individuals have and then go about using some sort of force to silence these opposing views that they're so offended by. And why are they so offended by these opposing views and have to take the action to make sure this speech and ideas aren't heard because they know very well that those ideas will negate and prove false what they are trying to push and what they are trying to present as reality to the public. These two professors were actually ran out of and forced to resign 
their um, professorships at um, Evergreen State College because they said some 100% in this physical universe truths that were basically non-controversial or that shouldn't have been. You got to listen to this episode just to hear the things that they were run out of town on. But well, Aaron, if I if I can just make a couple of comments, we're planning on put putting this in the show notes, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. So we'll make sure that's in there, uh, audience members. And Aaron, I'll just say it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I don't know if you recall this or not, Aaron, but you know my old jujitsu gym back in Olympia, Washington, where we've hosted ECQC multiple times is smack dab right next to that university. Mm -hmm. And it's well known for its intolerance to ideologies outside of the left. So that that's not surprising. Well, yeah, they, they, they lost their positions and, and I don't want to give too much away because this is again, a fascinating interview. But now, lastly, and then we'll we'll move on from these um, topics. They dispel. Okay, who is tired of hearing? Follow the science, right? Oh, I know I am, and because they aren't following the science, they they, they absolutely obliterate that concept. So j- you just got to listen to it for that again, so that it, it's it's. On the Ben Shapiro show, Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying, they are evolutionary biologists, and again, from the left, and I, I was just amazed by their brilliance and their um, their lack of bias. The, literally, I look forward you know, to that. scientists actually searching for truth no matter where it leads them, right? And that's what these two individuals they exuded on this interview. So I would, cool. I would highly recommend people go check that out. Man, I definitely look forward to that, Aaron. Thanks for sharing that, brother. You're welcome. Well, well hey, man, do we want to talk about our sponsors for a minute? Yeah, let's do it. You want to, you want to go first? Yep, sure will. Let's talk about Origin. OriginUSA.com. Man, I, I think it's it's pretty amazing. We always we always like to pinch ourselves of getting the support from from Origin, but I'm just going to talk about um, a few of their products that we get a lot out of. If you need extra protein and you need a protein shake, you will not get a more delicious uh, protein shake than than the Jocko Fuel Mulk Protein. It's keto friendly, so it has. I, I forget. I think it may only have two, two cars, maybe less, maybe one. Uh, I should know that, but it's definitely keto friendly. Tastes delicious. It's like dessert, man. Every now and then, I'll I'll drink it. Just if I'm if I'm hungry before bed, I'll 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 take it or take an extra one. So they have flavors like strawberry, chocolate, chocolate mint, chocolate peanut butter vanilla and they even have a raw flavor i think i'm going to get some because every now and then i like to make my own protein shake that that has a little more content that i can that's cool just kind of play around with so i'm gonna have to do that myself also the new jocko greens you know we don't get enough vegetables and fruit and and frankly these green drinks are awesome for replacing that but not mo- not many of them taste that good the Jocko Greens is delicious, so uh, it uses monk fruit for the sweetener, and and so it, it's it's got uh, very nutritious content, but tastes real good too. Aaron, you used your Path Ghee this week, didn't you? Oh yeah, I did. I did, and I guess this is a good a time as any to say I finally took my test for my Gracie Combatives belt and and got promoted the other night, got my new belt. I I thought I was going down in history as the longest four stripe white belt ever, but but what was fun is I was able to show my um my instructor the Path Gi logo and he was like, man, that is really cool. You know, he had never noticed it the the belts wrapped around the O, and I said, make sure, yeah. and because he had his black belt there, right, and it was it had some graying on it. 
you know, and, and I said, T- take a look at this, look at the black belts on this, on this um, path um, logo. And he goes, man, that is so cool. I said, see how it's graying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, that the principle behind that gi is just amazing, man. And, and so I was pumped. That's why I wanted to bring that up. I'm so proud of you, man. You're, you're getting after it in your, your jujitsu and, and keep that up, man. Thank you. So also I'll mention they also have the the path rash guard. It, it uses the same the same wrapped belts. Is that new? Around the, I, I believe so. Oh man, yeah, it's 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 awesome, man. Um, I'm gonna pick one of those up as well. It, it it actually the belts wrapping around. So for the audience out there, jujitsu ranks go from white to to blue, and man, it takes takes a long time to get the blue. And then uh, goes to purple, brown, black. And it kind of looks like it moves into red, but the tip of the black belt is also red most of the time. So that may be what they're they're showing there. Or it could mean that that they're showing red belt, which is the last rank in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So really cool rash guard, man. So, man, I think that's it for me, man. Go to origin.com and use EvoSec10 for 10% off. Awesome. Well, so I'm going to bring up our recent new sponsor, Keeper's Concealment. Those of you that know Keeper's Concealment, that's um, that was started by Spencer Keepers, one of our previous recent guests, who's an amazing guy. Awesome guy. We we love having incredible shooter too oh, and instructor. Oh yeah. Now, um, Keeper's Concealment is the original authority on appendix holsters and appendix training, and they also offer high-performance handgun training specializing in concealed carry performance. They're also a proud affiliate of CCW Safe, the truly proven legal service membership company that offers dedicated legal defense. Um, Heaven forbid you've been forced to use lethal force. Now, use code KC10OFF. That's KC10OFF and check them out at CCWSafe slash Keepers. Now, to buy a holster, sign up for a class, inquire about hosting a course, or join CCWSafe, you'll find all the info at KeepersConcealment.com. Good stuff, man. Spencer's a great dude, and we appreciate his support too. Oh, yeah. Well, man, I think uh, we're getting towards the gear section that we can kind of we can kind of go through this fairly quick. I'd like to add to our audience members out there our intent behind gear. We love gear ourselves, and and frankly, we want to focus on support gear. There's going to be times where we just simply talk about firearms too, but we want to focus on gear that supports you on the path. So, um. If you folks out there are into carbines, which I know I know Aaron and I are, one of the most important items to have is a sling. Now, the sling is to the rifle as the holster is to the pistol. It's extremely important. I'll argue this. If you're a new carbine shooter and you've gotten your your new rifle and it's and it's just bare, it's got iron sights. Um, and you're wondering what gear you really need because there's a lot of freaking gear and furniture you can add to a carbine out there, and some of it is very useful. A lot of it's not that necessary. But in my opinion, if you have two items, you're good to go, and that's a light, a white light, and then also a sling. So a couple of the slings that Aaron and I both love and use We'll go ahead and mention them, and, and again, the purpose of this episode is have the information available in the show notes and on our website. So the Proctor Sling is this minimalist sling that is very adjustable. The slider on it um, makes it to where you can adjust it um, to make it tight to sling over your shoulder or to sling it tight against your body, against your body armor if you're wearing body armor. And then quickly be able to push that slider out and get to action if necessary. 
And it, it's kind of interesting the way that Frank Proctor, he's a former SF guy, he said that that he used to use um, 550 cord to adapt his cheap GI slings to, to make them more versatile. So he built this sling using 550 cord at the ends to make it very versatile for multiple platforms, shotguns, ARs, depending on how you, you're going to mount your uh, how you're going to mount your sling. You don't need any specialized um, QD mounts and whatnot to, to mount the sling. So it's it's real versatile and it's only forty five dollars. Man, it, that, that, it's a bri- yeah. it's a brilliantly designed sling. I, I tell you, it's definitely my favorite. I I think I've got I think I've got four or five of them. Oh yeah, they're they're absolutely my favorite sling too as well. Um, I will say I do also love the Vickers sling, and and you know frankly I'm sitting right next to it right now. I got two two rifles in the room with me. I've got um, my ten ten and a half inch AR with the the Proctor sling on it, and I've also got my eight and a half or eight point three inch uh, three hundred blackout that I'm running the Vickers sling on. Again, it's only fifty two dollars and 95 cents and some people may balk at spending money i don't think that's very expensive Mm -mm. but if if people do balk at that sometimes you gotta buy once cry once you know i I think that's a an important way to look at it now eric what um how does that differ i mean obviously from the the mounting hardware it, it seems like i remember it can do single point also or Oh, well, depending on the, the mounts that you have, Aaron, um, but it is intended to be a two-point okay. sling. Okay. Um, like right now, I've grabbed my I've grabbed my uh, 300 Blackout, and I'm using QD mounts. I just want to try something different on this this smaller um, rig here. And it also has a, it has a tab on it that runs the slider. Now, I will say the slider runs the opposite direction, so <laughs> that's a little downside. It doesn't run the, the same direction for extension or tightening as the, the Proctor sling, but a, a few, a, a, a few um, slide sliding or a few um, usage of it, it, it I, I get used to so it. So you, you need to dry fire your sling now? Yeah, pro- probably. <laughs> pro- well, you know, I don't think – every time I've used it and I've used it under pressure, if I – if I do it just real quickly, I I I adjust <laughs> to it. It's no big deal, but I do also love it. it's light and it's super durable. So I, I think these two slings they're they're tough to beat, Aaron. What do you think? Oh, I agree. Um, now, you know when I first started getting into the roll in the dirt carbine training, you know about ten or so years ago, you know the hotness was the single point sling. You know, I, I'm, the the point is, I mean, man, if you're if you're going in and out of doors and clearing, um, you know, clearing houses, etc., boy, a, a single point sling is awesome, and especially if you're needing to shoot off of your support side, it's easy to get to. But from my work, the the two point sling works just fine, and it doesn't fall. You know, to be honest, doesn't slide down and. And hitching the nuts. <laughs> exactly. That's my problem with single point slings. <laughs> hitching the junk. And, and you know that I forgot to mention you can pick one of these up at Blue Force Gear and and again all these links will be in the show notes. So moving on, Aaron, don't you think it's important to have a, a shot timer? Not really. I can tell how well I'm doing just just by the sound of the the crack of the bullet going off. <laughs> so you you have an internal clock, is what you're saying? Yeah, a really really good one. Down and, and down to can... the thousandths of a second. <laughs> Man, you're much better than me. <laughs> what is it? Scott Jedelinski says that that uh, that. Um, people's visual. I think he just says. Um, I think he just says that humans are terrible shot timers. Yeah, I think he even says humans are shitty shot timers. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, man. I'm heading to the range. I can't go to the range without a freaking timer. 
It, it, right. it, would, it would nearly nearly be a waste of time. Well, and, and Aaron, I'll just add to this too. Um, if you're not using a timer, the majority of your dry fire practice, you're also missing out. Yeah. Because you still need to gauge your dry fire practice mm-hmm. if you're progressing. And you can kind of get lazy if you're not pushing yourself in your dry fire. And I'll quote an, uh, Annette Evans how – she says that that if you're not if you're not failing in dry fire practice, you're not training hard enough. And I'm probably I'm just paraphrasing that, but she says that in her her book, The Dry Fire Primer, awesome book. I guess I'm gonna have to put that in the show notes again too. But anyway, if you're not going all the way to failure in dry fire, you're you're not you're not training hard enough in your dry practice. So just want to bring that out there. With that said. I'll name a couple of, of the timers we use, but I'll also add in the show notes a uh, the the Make Ready app. It's not perfect. It I don't think that the, the app works good in in an actual live fire setting. But for folks out there that were trying to push them to dry fire with a timer, that that's a free app that you can use. I, I'll, I'll throw that in there as well. So as far as the, the primary timer I use, it's a it's a pack a packed club timer three. I mean this sucker's loud. If you can see this on the screen here, the audience I know can't because we're not on video. Is I've got some blue painters tape on here, and I'll just go ahead and depress the the button here real quick. <laughs> That's still pretty darn loud, you know. Um, oh yeah, I love the, got, the blue tape is always on my shot timers for for attenuating that loud beat. And you'll find something interesting here in just a second. That was my last par, which was 15 seconds for the particular drill that I was shooting, which was an emulated 25 yard drill. By the way, that's the reason it was at uh, at, at 15 seconds. But yeah, so I just showed when it went off and then the actual par time that I had set that's crucial in in, in dry fire and uh, in in the live fire range so that's uh, my favorite timer currently but I've also used the competition electronics pocket pro 2 as well when when I used to train a lot with with Mike Brown and so that's another excellent timer out Go figure. That's what you got, brother. Yeah. Um, my, <laughs> For some reason, I thought you had the pact as oh, well. Oh, bro, I did. And, and I'll tell you, um, I my favorite timer so far is the pact. It is simpler. It is easier to change par times. Yeah, It's just more streamlined. This, um, this Pocket Pro 2 does a ton of stuff. I don't know if I'll ever use use in. Maybe, maybe I will, but it's just it's fairly complicated, and I always have to remember which buttons to push to change the par times. And literally, I, okay, which one is it? Uh, yeah, that that's it. Okay, I mean, almost every time I use it. <laughs> and, and and as a contrast, I can run my pack club timer by feel. Yeah, most of the time. So, um. And I'll just add to that, the the reason we're bringing up these two particular pieces of gear, because it supports it supports you in your training and, and in your actual, the, the necessities of of running a carbine, you need a sling. And for your, your pistol or your carbine or shotgun um, defensive shooting practice, you need a timer. You need, you need to have a metric when you're training. So... We wanted to really push the the timer. If you don't have a timer, you know, if if that's a little bit a little bit of heavier costs, they're around one hundred and twenty dollars. Most of them, you know, but um, you know, save money for a little bit, and get you one because because you will reap major benefits from having it. Well, so. and, and I'm not kidding. If every now and then I'll I'll head out to my car and not find my timer in my bag. And I'll have a slight, you know, minor panic. Dude, did I leave my timer at home? Because I would have been dry firing with it, right? Right. Because, yes, I can shoot at the range without a timer. But I'm 
most every time I'm at the range, I'm doing drills where I need to see what my time is so I can see how I'm progressing and see what I need to work on. So it is yeah, or almost... Or see if you're digressing, you know. Exactly. If you're, you know, so make sure that, that you have to police up something within your shooting. Dude, so. I, I got to have targets. I got to have my pistol. I got to have some rounds. And I got to have my timer. It, it, yep. It's just a must. So, and I will bring up one more, Eric. I don't know if you want to try and put it in the show notes because I don't know how much help that'll be these days, but I don't know if you've heard of the AMG Labs Commander. Um, oh, absolutely. And I mean, it, it seems like it reminds me of a boutique um, guitar or um, amp company that kind of just has stuff when they feel like it or or is I, I don't know what to think because I've been looking on their website to try and get one of their timers for a year or so. It always says back ordered. Oh yeah, Aaron. I'm glad you actually mentioned that. Yeah, I'll throw that in there too because man, I've been monitoring that. I want one of those timers too. Absolutely. I want to want to put that in my in my bag as well. I, so I believe I'm it's glad what you brought it up. um I believe it's what uh, Mike Seeklander uses. Uh, yeah, yeah. He the, the last time, and it was funny because I couldn't remember the AMG Lab timer, and I shot Mike over a, an email, and and he came back and said that his two favorite timers are the AMG Labs and the Pack Club okay. uh, Three timer. So that's cool. So yeah. So he is using it, and I mean, one of the key things is that. I mean, it's half the size of these other timers, which aren't huge or anything, but it still matters. I mean, you can't really put a this pocket. It's called a Pocket Pro, but that doesn't really much go in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. So, and man, we we like to we like to get advice from world champion shooters like Mike Seeklander. Oh yeah. So yeah, I, I, hopefully they'll come. Hey, if if. If you guys are listening there at AMG Labs, we would really like to get some of your timers. So, you know, let us all know when you, when you have them available. <laughs> That'd be great. I mean, we'll pay for them. No problem. Of course. We just wanna... <laughs> yeah, we just want, yeah, we just we'll, want to we'll know when, when, when you can send one out. <laughs> yeah. We'll take some sponsor gear, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Well, well, hey, Aaron, man, I, man, I think this has been fun. We've... We probably put forth a, a show about the normal time. They maybe, maybe uh, not as long, but man, I, I think we covered a lot of stuff. And me too. And hopefully. it's fun. A little bit more laid back. We we hit some heavier stuff, but we are here just to have a good conversation. And and we hope that our audience wants to join in and just just chill out and and um, have a fun time with us talking about some other topics. Than, than we normally get to talk about. Well, Eric, I guess then we're going to let everybody go. But, you know, before we do, I just wanted to give this really important reminder. Everybody out there, make sure that you have your eyes up and open when you're in gas station parking lots. And when you're at home, all the time you're home, have your doors locked. Those two simple things will self-select you out of so many lethal encounter events or, um, or assault events. It's, it's unbelievable. Those are some of the most important super ninja moves that you can do. Just a reminder. We all need reminder for that. I just got home yesterday and my back door was unlocked. One of my boys must have left the daggum thing open. And I often, <laughs> I often say... Guys, please lock the door. I do not want to shoot somebody today. <laughs> That's good advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, buddy, you have a good evening, and I'll talk to you soon. It's been awesome hanging out with you, Aaron. Talk to you next time. <laughs>